Well, our topic tonight, you know, uh, we're dealing with uh, the United States and the altered world. Uh, it's a uh, extraordinarily interesting time. It's a major challenge to the wisdom of Americans and others, and uh, it's a very sad time that uh, we have on one hand uh, uh, profoundly interesting intellectual questions about statecraft, and at the same time we're a part of and witnessing uh, an enormous uh, human tragedy. And we're very pleased, though, that we have this distinguished panel with us uh, to discuss uh, uh, the matters of the day. The uh, chairman of the panel is Robert Ruby, who presently is the foreign editor of The Sun. Mr. Ruby is responsible for having organized the panel. Uh, he's well known to most of you. He's served as a correspondent for The Sun for over nine years in Europe and the Middle East. He's written a couple of books. He's reported from over 30 countries during that time. And as chair of the panel, uh, he'll introduce the rest of the panel. I should make only one uh, uh, comment, and that is the session this evening will go until 7.30, which is longer than usual, in order to accommodate uh, a panel rather than an individual presentation. If some of you do have to leave early, I would suggest that you leave before the Q&A begins. But in any case, it's my enormous pleasure to uh, present Mr. Robert Ruby. Thank you very much, and an early good evening to everyone. When I was uh, preparing for tonight, I went back to read some presidential speeches from times of crisis or times when important allies seemed to be at a crossroads. The Middle East, of course, came to mind. And I took the liberty of stitching together some excerpts from speeches by four presidents as if it were one short speech by one president. This is from, uh, what, I'm, what I'm about to read is by, it's a little bit by Woodrow Wilson, uh, introducing the 14 points in January 1918. Uh, the first President Bush, Bush, Bush 41, speaking uh, five weeks after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. President Clinton speaking in July 2000 after the collapse of the Camp David talks between Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat, and the current President Bush speaking Monday. Let me read this as if it were one address. It's quite short. The day of conquest and aggrandizement has gone by. What we demand, therefore, is nothing peculiar to ourselves. It is that the world be made fit and safe to live in. Out of these troubled times, a new world order can emerge, a new era, freer from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, and more secure in the quest for peace. Israelis and Palestinians are destined to live side by side, destined to have a common future. They have to decide what kind of future it will be. It's important that the people who the leaders represent understand that this is a script that's never been written before. They have to write a script, and they've got to keep working on it. Last paragraph. There is a mutual responsibility to achieve peace, and it's going to require leadership on both sides. I meant what I said about withdrawal without delay, and I mean what I say when I call upon the Arab world to strongly condemn and act against terrorist activity. All of this was to remind myself of something that should be obvious, but that I think reporters, I know editors, and I suspect even presidents forget. It's that the steering wheel that presidents think they hold in their hands doesn't, isn't always connected to the wheels. <laughs> every, every president 
in his administration takes hold of the steering wheel, the offices and officials controlling foreign policy, and purposely steers a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, and early on, usually, has the great pleasure of sensing the wheels respond. In times of crisis, as was the case last September, an administration and the Congress and the public can lift the whole apparatus, set it on a new road and on a new course. You suddenly take an interest in the roads of Central Asia. You start driving into Afghanistan. And then, every time, the mechanism fails. It doesn't respond the way a president expected it to, or even the way it used to. You turn the steering wheel, and the car does not respond as crisply as it once did. The mechanism, the world, does not respond. The Middle East once again comes to mind. A new world order free from the threat of terror? No, it didn't happen. More modestly this week, withdrawal without delay? It didn't happen. Israelis and Palestinians have to write a script. That was President Clinton. Yes, they do. It remains unwritten. Afghanistan has to write a script. A new script is probably going to be needed for Iraq. We don't know who's going to be the author of it. Presidents, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense always find these scripts almost impossible to write, the actors difficult to control. That was the way of the old world before last September. That is the way of the new altered world. It's also going to be the subject for my three colleagues, and I'd like to introduce them. Mark, Ma um, Mark Matthews was the Sun's Middle East correspondent until July. He's now the paper's diplomatic correspondent based in Washington. He's covered the Middle East peace process through at least four administrations. He and I were together in Madrid in uh, 91, 92, and it's, it's endless. Will England returned in early September from his second stint as one of the Sun's Moscow correspondents. That was in early September. About 10 minutes after the plane landed and before he unpacked, he got on another plane to go back to Russia, then to Tajikistan, then into Afghanistan. He's now an editorial writer specializing in foreign affairs. Tom Bowman is the Sun's Pentagon correspondent. In February, he traveled to Afghanistan with 101st Army Airborne Division and reported from Kandahar. Thanks very much, Robert. I'd like to start off by saying that Charlie Cordry is still mentioned in glowing terms at the Pentagon. He was a terrific correspondent and my predecessor, of course, at the Pentagon. Yes, I was a guest of the 101st Airborne Division at the lovely bombed out Kandahar Airport uh, back in February. And what struck me about uh, Kandahar when I was there, first of all, was the amazing security at the airport. And I kept thinking about 20 years ago in Lebanon when the Marines went in there, three rifle companies with almost no security at all, very little, if any, armor. And anyone uh, who could come up to the gate there was no checks at all, and as a result, a suicide bomber killed 241 Marines. And I was struck at how different it was in Kandahar 20 years later, that the, there were two gates, one a mile from the second gate, um, 2,000 U.S. troops, roughly, 101st Airborne, German, Danes, Finns, Special Forces, eight Apache helicopters, Chinooks, armored Humvees. They kept the mines around the airport to prevent anybody from coming in. Um, even I had to wait at the front gate for two hours to get in, even though I was a guest and um, was frisked like everybody else when I came in, even though I had my press pass. So it just shows you how different the situation is now for the troops. 
And also while I was there, there were a couple of people trying to uh, attack, the, well, attack the perimeter, a couple of locals. And they were immediately set on by two Apache attack helicopters, probably 40 soldiers, and a couple of Humvees and some bright lights. And they turned out to be three teenagers. And I don't say that to cast any aspersions on the troops there. They're highly trained, motivated, and they fought bravely up at Anaconda. But I think it illustrates a point. And the colonel there told us that, he said, the number one mission for us here is our own security. And the reporters who were there were sort of looking at each other, saying, well, wait a minute. If, if, your sole, if your primary mission is your own security, how can you accomplish the mission at hand? And a lot of officers, since I got back, have raised the same question as well. And the other issue is the number of forces there. Did the United States have enough forces to control events on the ground? Infantry officers will always tell you that you have to have boots on the ground to control the turf. And now that the Afghan conflict is, is winding down somewhat, there's a lot of second guessing now among defense analysts as well as military officers that the United States didn't go in with enough troops initially. They had 17 uh, 12 member Green Beret A teams with 15,000 Afghan allies. And what happened as a result of that? In Mazari Sharif and Kabul and Kandahar, many Taliban and Al Qaeda escaped, and people like Omar were able to negotiate their way out of it. And at Tora Bora in December, more Al Qaeda escaped filtered over the border into Pakistan. And we saw the same thing happen in Anaconda. Hundreds, if not thousands, of Al-Qaeda and Taliban filtered again across the border into Pakistan. And above and beyond that, if, you, if you're relying, for the most part, on your Afghan allies, when all is said and done, they're going to grab power, as they did. The Northern Alliance is heavily weighted now in the government. They run the defense ministry. And 37 of the 38 top officers in the military are either Tajik or Uzbek, even though Pashtun is the dominant minority there. The warlord issue, too, is still ripe over there. The warlords sent a certain number of their troops to take part in the National Army, and they're not stupid. They withheld most of the troops in their own area to keep them there. They sent a small number to Kabul. So I think, and then the other thing, of course, is that uh, the peacekeeping forces are only centered in Kabul now. The United States has refused to send any peacekeeping troops. What Rumsfeld wants to do is eliminate the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and then to get out as quickly as possible. But it looks like they won't be able to do that. We've heard the stories about uh, the hundreds that were arrested up in Kabul trying to take over the government of Karzai and the recent attack on Fahim, the defense minister. Most people will tell you that the security situation is disintegrating there, spiraling downward. But the United States and other countries refuse to send more troops in to be able to make a difference. And we raised this issue last week with Rumsfeld, who, despite uh, how he's a matinee idol now, is quite thin-skinned when we press him on certain issues. And he said to a reporter who said, well, how can you say the situation is great over there? And he rightly said that, you know, the Taliban is no more. Al-Qaeda has been disrupted. And this reporter said, well, wait a minute, but these hundreds of guys arrested in Kabul, and then Fahim was, was attacked and almost killed. How do you reconcile that when things are going well? And he snapped at this reporter and said, I don't know how your mind can get around that concept and so forth. But I think in the coming weeks and months, maybe even years, Unless more troops go in there, U.S. troops or allied troops, I think the situation is going to continue to deteriorate, and Rumsfeld is going to get more questions like that. Thank you. Good evening. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, Kathy Lally, my one-time colleague in Moscow, two-time colleague in Moscow, um, was originally supposed to be on the program tonight, and she 
um, can't be. Uh, she sends her regards to everyone. She's sorry she's not here. She's in Cleveland uh, with her mother who had back surgery on Tuesday and everything's going pretty well. She told me today that the hospital staff is doing a very good job of ignoring both the patients and the visitors. <laughs> but that this is a good sign because it's when they start paying attention to you that you know you're in trouble. Which strikes, strikes me as being somewhat like the situation the Afghans were in before uh, <laughs> the Americans started paying attention to them. You know, uh, I think the Americans are listening to us now. I think, I think we're in trouble. Well, I want to level with you about one thing. Uh, I've, I've been to a couple of these before. Um, I don't know if anybody here has been, one, I, th I think a few people have been to them before as well. And we would be flown back from the far corners of the world and uh, put on, I would put on a suit to come here. It would usually be the only day out of the year that I would wear a suit. And I would try to be very sober and speak dispassionately and with a more or less a uh, more in sorrow than an anger kind of tone. But my feeling is that now that I've gone to the editorial department, um, or as we like to call it, the, the uh, throat clearing department, <laughs> I, I, can, I can put all that aside. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll begin. I, uh, I want to speak about Central Asia, but I'll begin um, first with Afghanistan, um, because I was there just a little bit before Tom was. I was in the north, whereas he was in the south. And to give you an idea of the foreign correspondent's life when we're not wearing a suit, I brought this very nice pakul, which I bought in the Renek in, in uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the bazaar in Talakan one day. Every Northern Alliance fighter has to have one. And I, this scarf, which I bought in a very nice little shop, in Talakan as well. This, this became the foreign correspondent's uniform in <laughs> Afghanistan. Now, I have to f say I felt slightly self-conscious buying these things, except that several hours after I bought this scarf, I was using it to bandage a serious wound that a colleague of mine had suffered in Kunduz. So I was awfully glad I had it. She later washed it out for me, and I, I, I wear it to this day, and I, I think of her. Um, when I do. Afghanistan was, you know, it was in, believe it or not, in the fall, we were paying more attention to Afghanistan than we were to the Middle East, and it was the, it was the big story. But I got there through the former Soviet republics of Central Asia. I actually spent more time last year in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan than I did in Afghanistan. And uh, considering that the U.S. now has troops in, in Uzbekistan and in Kyrgyzstan, and may have or may soon have troops in Tajikistan as well. Um, it's, I think, very important to uh, notice, to pay attention, you know, to this greater area, the sort of the, the suburbs of Afghanistan, the concentric rings, you might say, um, because it's, a, it's, as I said very briefly at this gathering last year, I believe Central Asia is an extremely important place. Now that I'm no longer a dispassionate foreign correspondent, but an editorial writer, I can tell you in all sincerity that it's also a seriously screwed up place. Um, the good news is it's always been screwed up. The bad news is we're now there, and we're in the middle of it. And we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to deal with that. Our troops landed, uh, but they did not land into a you know, historic vacuum. So forgive me for a moment if I just outline some of the context of Central Asia. There, of course, the Silk Road ran through there. Um, it was an area with legendarily cruel, imaginatively cruel uh, leaders until the, in, until the, I was gonna say the last century, the, the 19th century. Um, it was noted for its cruelty and torture and um, beautiful architecture. The uh, Russians, of course, started heading in that direction in the 1800s and were horrified in many senses by what they found there. There was a painter named Voroshagin who went to Bukhara and Samarkand, in, which in today, today's Uzbekistan, 
in the 1870s, I think, and he came back to Moscow with a whole series of oil paintings that essentially were variations on the theme, the theme being a head on a stake, and people uh, in colorful oriental garb admiring the head on the stake. Sometimes there were many heads, sometimes there was one head. Um, he later became a pacifist, surprisingly enough. <laughs> the Russian idea was that the only way to, to um, keep the, 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 the cruelty and then the, you know, what they saw as the oriental mentality of Central Asia from overwhelming them, the Russians, was to embrace them. The only way they could, they could keep them from, um, you know, exploding was to cover them in an embrace. And they used the same um, policy in, in the Caucasus as well. So from the, for approximately, for a little over 100, 120 years, Russian policy was to hold Central Asia in a very, very firm embrace. Communism overlaid a veneer of unscrupulous immorality on top of that, but it was essentially the same policy. Um, the Russians, of course, helped to screw up Central Asia in many regards by uh, creating this plantation cotton economy, which today is a, is a shambles, and um, by suppressing a lot of very smart people there. Uh, they also brought roads and hospitals and forced women to throw off the veil and um, gave enterprising Central Asians a chance to come to the universities in St. Petersburg and Leningrad and Moscow and, and enter into what you might call for want of a better word, European society, which is not entirely a bad thing, I would say. Well, how's that for a uh, potted history? Um, oh, did I, did I mention the bug pit? Sorry. In Bukhara, has anybody here ever been to Bukhara by any chance? A couple of people. Well, it's a beautiful place. You know it's a beautiful place. In sometime in, I think, the 1880s, a British officer rode into Bukhara from India, and the emir immediately threw him and had him cast into a bug pit um, outside the, the Registan, Registan in Muhara. And he was left there. And eventually, another officer came to see if he could negotiate the first officer's release. And he, too, was thrown into the bug pit. And the, the two of them were there for something like six or seven or eight years in the pit. Finally, the emir of Bukhara got bored with the diversion and had them pulled out and beheaded. So it's that kind of place. Um, it is, it's in a very bad way today. It's, it's sad because it didn't have, it didn't need to have, wait a minute, it, it didn't have to have turned out that way. Um, and the U.S. could have done something about it earlier, and we didn't. Um, with the, the downfall of the Soviet Union in 1991, there were naturally communist satraps running these places, except for Kyrgyzstan, and uh, their opponents. Their opponents, you have to understand, were, the, were opponents in the Soviet uh, mold, the Soviet idea of an opponent, which means that they considered themselves supporters of perestroika. They considered themselves supporters of glasnost. They considered themselves supporters of free speech. Um, they identified with Islam, just as the Western Ukrainians identified with Catholicism, and just as Russian dissidents identified with Orthodoxy. Islam for them was the uncommunism. Therefore, it was good, and it was the it was it was a cultural pillar of traditional Uzbek society. It didn't take long for the people running the Central Asian countries, in particular in Tajikistan and later in, F in uh, I'm sorry, in Uzbekistan, to, to figure out that, you know, um, what was going on. And they, they, you know, they could add two plus two. So they suddenly said, these opponents of ours are Islamic extremists. They're fundamentalists. And we can't have that in Central Asia. And they went about suppressing them every way they knew how, jailings and uh, beatings, killings, etc. Well, 
what was the effect of this? The, the, the sort of democratically inclined, the liberals among these dissidents, if they weren't killed or they didn't go to jail, typically um, ended up going abroad to Moscow or even to, the, or to Europe or to this country. And who was left? Who was left? People who said, finally, who said, okay, if he's going to call me a, a Muslim fundamentalist, fine. I'll be a Muslim fundamentalist if that is what it's going to take to stand up to this oppressive power. And that is pretty much what happened in Tajikistan and later in Uzbekistan. Russia, of course, was, was vastly weakened, um, but it stood by it, it. It was content to let this go on. The United States did almost nothing about this during this time. Tajikistan descended into a really awful civil war, which they're now somewhat coming out of. The U.S. did provide rice and wheat, rice and flour to the Tajiks at a time of great need, and the Tajiks were aware of that. And in fact, the, Taj uh, the U.S. is still supplying uh, wheat to um, approximately one million Tajiks who would go hungry otherwise, and there is a lot of good feeling about that. I might add as well that the U.S. was the largest supplier of food to Afghanistan under the Taliban and is still the largest supplier of food to Afghanistan. Um, the Tajiks are, are kind of came out of that a little bit. In Uzbekistan, it just went, however, from, from bad to worse, to worse, to worse. The, uh, once repression, you know, gets, gets uh, going, it takes on a life of its own. The president of Uzbekistan, a man named Islam Karimov, uh, has treated, well, treated any, any dissent with, with um, a complete brutality. Any man with a, a beard is going to be thrown into prison. There was a man in a, in a village in a, in a place called the Fergana Valley who disappeared, and it was thought that he had probably gone off to join the group that has Late, has now become known as the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Because of this, what did the police do? This man was 32 years old, by the way. What did the police do? They arrested every single male member of his high school class and put them in jail. Now, you know, that's community policing. Uh, thousands of Uzbeks are in, in prison camps whole villages have been, have been cleared out. Um, the, in, the, in, the, in the rural areas, uh, a lot of angry young men have been recruited to this group, which I alluded to before, the Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan. As recently as last summer, even though this group had been making incursions, they, they trained in Afghanistan, been making incursions into Uzbekistan, I spoke with an American diplomat who assured me that, you know, they were several dozen rabble-rousers. They were nothing to be concerned about. It was not a problem at all. Uh, this fall, President Bush mentioned the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan you know, as one of the fountainheads of worldwide terrorism. My guess is that the truth actually lies somewhere in between. Um, they were organized by a man named Juma Namangani, who may or may not have been killed in the bombing. Uzbekistan. Um, they, are, they were a force to be reckoned with to some extent. Um, they may arise again. It's hard to know. But there's another movement, another organization in Uzbekistan which is much quieter and much more extensive. It's a uh, party, an underground party, outlawed underground party called Hizbut Tahrir, which is, I think, has its roots in um, Palestine and Lebanon. I, I, think perhaps Lebanon, but founded by Palestinians in the 50s. But anyway, they believe in, a, in, the, in a, the establishment of a worldwide caliphate, worldwide Islamic state. They don't believe in violence, you know, according to their, their documents and according to what they say. They, I don't think they've perpetrated any violence. Whereas the, the guerrilla movement has its roots in the rural areas, Hizbut Tahrir has roots in the cities of Uzbekistan. Um, they're there, and they're very unhappy. What I noticed when I was in Tashkent this summer is that where in the past, 
no one in Uzbekistan would say, would get into a political conversation with you ever. I mean, you'd, you'd be crazy to do it, particularly with a foreigner, with a guy wearing a pakul like this. You know, I, if I could have generated a three days growth of whiskers, that would have been better. But anyway, I couldn't do that overnight. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to give you the, the best image that I can. Anyway, um, the, the last summer, though, the unhappiness in Uzbekistan was palpable. Everyone was talking about it. The economy is in a complete mess. Western companies went in there in the 90s, Procter & Gamble uh, foremost among them, and they've thrown up their arms. You, you can't do business. You can't export things without huge bribes. You can't import anything without huge bribes. You can't take money out of the country. It's hard enough to take money into the country. Well, you can take money into the country pretty easily, but you can't take money out of the country. It's bribes, bribes, bribes. I went to interview the commercial attaché at the Chinese embassy, because I'd heard that the Chinese were moving into the vacuum that the Americans had left, that the Chinese weren't um, you know, hobbled by the sort of moral qualms that would have prevented a, a company like Enron, for instance, from you know, trying to make, <laughs> do business in Uzbekistan. Now, can you imagine this? Can you imagine a commercial attaché at an American embassy ever talking on the record to an American reporter, much less a Chinese reporter who walks in off the street. But this Chinese woman was perfectly happy to talk to me, and she said, this place is ridiculous. Yeah, you, know, you can't do business here. We have the same problems you do. It's, 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 a, it's a mess. So the result is tremendous, tremendously bad economy. You know, you've got like three different rates for changing money plus a black market rate. Unhappiness rampant throughout Uzbekistan. Now, what has happened since September 11th. Well, the U.S. Army uh, has arrived. Is it the Army or the Air Force? Army. Army, Army and Air Force, thank you. And they are, they are keeping such a low profile that you could spend years driving around their base and never lay eyes on an American. But everybody, everybody knows they're there. And the point, of course, is that if there were ever to be unrest in Uzbekistan, you know, I, I firmly believe that American forces would not be called into action to help suppress that. But, 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 just their being there has helped to kind of, you know, put a damper on things. Uh, Uzbekistan has been quite quiet, um, you know, since the fall. Who wants to stir up trouble? Look what happened in Afghanistan, you know. The thing is, just by being there, American forces are helping to preserve the status quo. And the point is that most people there hate the status quo. What I would argue is that um, if, if we're going to be there, you know, we, we have to take advantage of this, the opportunity. Don't look at it as a problem, but the opportunity it provides us to also um, make our interest known in the development of a civil society in Afghanistan. There are pl plenty of people there still who, who, would, who would hope to see such a thing be developed. If we stand by, we're going to be on the side of the bad guy who will be fighting against the Islamic fundamentalist. You know, what kind of a choice is that? Better, I would say, to take action than than to ignore the place. Now, um, in Tajikistan, the situation is somewhat similar. In other parts of Central Asia, you know, broadly, it's very similar. In Turkmenistan, you've got a truly strange man as leader who keeps all foreigners out. I think lots and lots of drugs come through uh, Turkmenistan, and plenty of arms were going through it in the other direction, too. Um, Afghanistan, but you would, there was almost no way of finding out because, because you can't get in there. Now, I'd like to end by just talking a little bit about, very, very briefly, about Russia and its interests in um, Central Asia. I believe that Putin was brilliant. He, he, was, he took the lead in, in understanding what it would mean to Russia to allow American troops to go into Uzbekistan, into Tajikistan, if that's what we wanted, into Kyrgyzstan. And he, he fought for that, he fought for that, he, he, he pushed for that, much to the astonishment of his generals and members of the parliament and the rest of that. But he understood that he has maneuvered 
Americans into sending in their troops to protect Russian interests in Central Asia. It's almost as brilliant as the Reagan administration managing to get Cuban troops to protect Chevron's interests in Angola in the 1980s. Um, and I, I think Russians will come to see this themselves. But lest we, lest we um, imply you know, um, too much of a Machiavellian brilliance to Russian strategy, I would just say that the last day I was in um, Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan, I went to visit a Russian journalist, the kind of Russian journalist who wears epaulets on his day job, who wanted to talk about the, the strategic situation in Afghanistan. So we went to his apartment in Dushanbe, and he spread out these maps of Afghanistan that were, you know, like from here all the way over to here. And, they, and that was like five miles worth of Afghanistan. They were incredible maps, the kind of, of like of which I had never seen before, particularly in Russia, where the maps are an abomination. They were the, the contour lines must have represented changes in elevation of about two feet. They were just, it was, it was astonishing. So he gets this map out, he spreads it all out, and he gives me a 30 to 45 minute lecture on naming, you know, units and, 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 and the people involved in this and that and the, and the political feuds among the, among the various people on why the Northern Alliance would never be able to capture Mazari Sharif. Now, as you can imagine, when I got back to my hotel room that night, the Northern Alliance had just captured Mazari Sharif. So, I'll leave you with that. Good evening. Uh, Robert asked me to speak with, uh, to describe how Colin Powell sees the world. Uh, <laughs> Today, I think when, uh, when if Colin Powell looks at the world, all he, can, all he can see is a very small patch of ground on the eastern Mediterranean that's erupting in an earthquake, and that earthquake is sending tremors all across the Middle East uh, and threatening to uh, push northward toward Europe and uh, reaching to Asia and, and sending ripples across the Atlantic uh, to affect the United States in the, in the form of shocks to the oil market and uh, possibly spreading violence. Um, that's why he's there. He tried, the Bush administration tried for 18 months to figure out a way of uh, intervening in the conflict that would that would make a difference. Uh, I, I think they were uh, they had very strong doubts that anything would work, uh, but now they're they feel as though they've been they've been pulled by events in into the conflict and and they can't avoid it. Uh, the And Powell is there. Um, he doesn't say how far he how far he really wants to go. Whether his his aim is a ceasefire, or whether his uh, whether he wants to get something much more solid put together in the in the form of a peace track, uh, and he he won't define success because that would simply doom his mission while he's there and, and before he leaves. Um, I think starting tomorrow and again on, on Sunday, he's going to face a pair of brick walls. Um, Ariel Sharon is going to welcome Colin Powell very warmly. He, uh, American officials are always warmly welcomed in Israel. But I don't think Ariel Sharon is, is in any mood to be cooperative with the United States right at the moment. He, the Israeli army was finally in, engaged in a month-long 
effort that they believed was going to repeat what Sharon himself had tried in Gaza and uh, something that actually succeeded at considerable cost, but it su succeeded for a number of years in, in curbing the terrorism that was erupting from Gaza in the 1970s. Uh, they have um, arrested, I've lost track of the number, but hundreds of militants. Many of them are being interrogated. They are providing leads to others, and uh, they would like to painstakingly go through a process of matching up names and people and uh, rounding up all the, all the planners and, and perpetrators of terrorism. Powell is asking them to uh, interrupt this mission right in the middle, and they, and they don't want to do that. Um, when he gets to Ramallah, Arafat will also greet him warmly. Arafat will probably not be as obstinate sounding. Uh, his usual manner of dealing with Americans is to smile, uh, say, uh, yes, I want to help you, I want to cooperate, and then wait for the American official to leave and not follow through. When he's pressed by American officials at, at the, usually, the, uh, the end point of a, of a negotiation, he d will dig in his heels and say, you are making us slaves. Uh, Sharon is now in a very strong position domestically. Uh, he, he believes the, uh, and many Israeli people believe that finally the Israeli government is taking strong action that is going to make a difference. Arafat has never been in as, as strong a position as he is now since he arrived back in the region in the, uh, after the Oslo Accords of 1993. He is not only extremely popular among his people, but he is, uh, his popularity is spreading throughout the Arab world. He probably chortles when he uh, look, turns on Al Jazeera TV and realizes that his colleagues among the leaders of the Arab world, all of whom detest him cordially, uh, are seeing him on TV and seeing his face in, among the demonstrators in their streets. How does, how, how does Powell get, get past this hurdle? We can go through the list of things that have, have tried and failed. Oslo was a peace process without a clear idea of what was going to be at the end point. And uh, for seven years, a suspicion mounted on, on both sides, the Israeli and the Palestinian, that when it came to the crunch, the other side wasn't going to, wasn't going to complete the deal. Uh, it also uh, proved to be far too much for the United States to manage. It was a step-by-step -step series of in incremental steps that, they, that both sides were supposed to take that would um, inspire confidence, get, uh, make the populations optimistic, uh, reduce the, the level of hatred, and finally, at the end, this uh, reduction in hatred and uh, reconciliation would make the tough choices that they had to make much easier. Well, that, that didn't work. It, I mean, it, it, it fell apart gradually, uh, and it, it, the United States in order to keep such a thing going, would have to assign the Secretary of State or somebody, or, or somebody at an equal level almost as a full-time nursemaid. Uh, that, so I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, you can't impose a solution 
in this sort of situation. Israel is a democracy. It's very difficult to impose anything from the outside on a democracy, and I think most Americans would be un uncomfortable doing that. Uh, benign neglect, which was tried over the past 18 months, has only made the situation much, much worse. And if uh, anybody imagined that the Israelis and Palestinians were somehow going to fight each other to a standstill, or that one side was going to win hands down, don't know the Israelis and the Palestinians. This is not South Lebanon. Uh, this is survival for both, and they, and they see it that way. How does, how does Powell get beyond that? I think Powell is taking at least the outlines of a plan. A great many people have the same idea of the end solution that has to take place in order for there to be peace there. And it's, uh, it goes back 35 years. It is two states with borders that provide Israel security, and it includes, and this is probably of utmost importance, wide recognition and acceptance of Israel within the Arab world. This is, uh, this is the, the basic, the outline of a plan that's contained in United Nations resolutions. Uh, this is the outline presented by President Clinton just before he left office. It's the outline of the Saudi Crown Prince's proposal, and it has been in basically endorsed by Colin Powell and by the White House. Uh, the question is, there have been plans before. It was the Rogers plan, the Schultz plan, every one of uh, Powell's predecessors, with a, a few exceptions, has had some idea of, of a plan. What's going to make this different? Uh, selling the plan is going to make it different. And that's where Colin Powell can probably set himself apart from some of his predecessors. He's an extremely good salesman. And he has strong support in the United States. So long as he keeps the president behind him, and so long as the president keeps the administration united, uh, probably members of Congress will give him some latitude. Uh, I th I th and bit by bit, he may be able to uh, whittle away at the broad distrust towards him and towards any plan that he might, might bring on either side. He's going to, he's going to have to keep uh, looking over his shoulder because there are a number of people in the region and also here, who, who expect him to fail. There are, uh, there is a, a school of thought in Washington that it is pointless for the United States to try to push any kind of peace plan between the Israelis and the Palestinians right now because the, the, the region just, uh, the environment in the region is, uh, is all wrong for it. You've got, uh, Elderly dictators uh, in many of the states surrounding um, in, the, in the Persian Gulf and uh, in Egypt, not in, not in Jordan, not in, not in Syria, but in Syria, the, uh, the current president is uh, just as, just as hard-nosed and uh, 
just as hostile to Israel as his father was. He just doesn't seem to be quite as smart. Um, There, in Iran and in Iraq, uh, the leaders are just anxious to see Colin Powell stumble and to see the United States kind of leave the problem with its tail between its legs. Uh, and there was a very uh, quite influential school of thought in Washington that if the United States went in and first toppled Saddam Hussein, that would rearrange the furniture of the region, put the, uh, put the, the radical states in retreat, make them, make them fearful of being the next targets, and, in that, and send the uh, terrorists in the West Bank, Gaza, and into, into some kind of retreat. Um, I think Afghanistan has, has demonstrated that even a major display of American power doesn't cause lasting change in that, in that particular part of the world. So I think for the, I think for the moment, President Bush is at least letting his Secretary of State try, try to get something started, move toward that plan that I just out outlined. And then if it, if it doesn't work, they will, have to, they will have to take stock once again. And, and they have been taking stock right along, and, they, and the um, statements that you see coming out of the White House and from, and from Powell point to almost a nightmare scenario of the various things that could, that could possibly go wrong if, if a conflict were to spread. Already we're seeing the danger of a spread on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Uh, young President Assad of, of Syria uh, is given considerable latitude to Hezbollah to attack Israel across the border and to uh, to attack the troops that are that are in what remain of uh, in part of the Golan Heights, which which Lebanon claims uh, mostly to uh, to give Hezbollah a reason to continue attacking. Israel. Uh, one, of those, one of those Hezbollah rockets could kill a number of civilians, and Israel is going to have to retaliate, and they have promised to retaliate very strongly, and that could be a spark that uh, starts a wider conflict. If there is a wider conflict, the uh, options available to the United States are going to shrink drastically. Uh, we have a 50-year commitment to the survival of, this, of the state of Israel, and when it, when it comes down to that, that's the, that's the commitment that has to be adhered to. And the other relationships that we have in the region even America's dependence on Persian Gulf oil are going to have to uh, are going to have to take second place. Um, so I th think, faced with this nightmare scenario, uh, Colin Powell, with uh, with President Bush supporting him, is going to do his damnedest not to fail this time around. Thank you. One of the problems about understanding the area where you were talking about, and especially Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, 
is that I never knew an awful lot about that to begin with, and I can't say that your press has informed me an awful lot at the time when you think we should have been paying attention to it, simply because there wasn't, wasn't going to sell many of your newspapers. I mean, we paid more attention to Somalia in a more dramatic way than we did to areas which you think were far more crucial at that same time. How do we get around that problem that those issues don't sell newspapers and get that into people's minds in such a way that they can focus on the issues in a sensible way so that we can actually influence our government to do something about what's important? I, I would say I'm, I'm all for selling newspapers. Um, and one should not dismiss what happened in Somalia. I, let me. Let me agree with you a little bit and disagree with you a lot. Um, most people here, I, I think, have forgotten that the horrible incident in Somalia that led to the, the, this Black Hawk Down incident occurred the day after Russian troops shelled the White House in Moscow um, in the, the um, parliamentary uprising in 1993. Um, there was I would argue, having been in Moscow at the time, there was a considerable amount of very important news in Russia um, during the Somalia thing, which didn't get on, never made it back to the front page for about a month and a half after that. So, um, in that sense, you know, you're right. Um, news organizations tend to go where the where the sparks are and can ignore some pretty important stuff. I I would argue, on the other hand, that I think. Um, Re readers themselves often don't notice what's in the paper. Both my uh, colleague Kathy and I were in Central Asia several times um, before the Somalia um, business erupted. She, she particularly was in Tajikistan quite a lot in 91 and 92, and I was in Uzbekistan in 92 and Kyrgyzstan. Um, so, you know, we were there. I doubt anybody here remembers any of the stories we wrote. Um, you know, that's, that, that's, that's the way it is. You know, we do what we can. I think The Sun has a, uh, really has made an effort, uh, particularly in areas where there isn't a lot of daily breaking news, in other words, outside the Middle East, to let the correspondents go and find stories that are, that are important and not necessarily um, off the daily news. Uh, um, and I hope that that um, kind of policy will continue. Uh, the uh, end of the session has arrived. Uh, as always, we, we enjoy these sessions with the, uh, the panel and for sharing their experience and thoughts with us. We're deeply grateful. Thank you very much.